We're now joined by John Sifton, who's uh, Asia Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch. Thanks very much indeed for joining us and welcome to the program. Thanks. Um, is Joe Biden not reading the room correctly in his actions? What's your take on this action? I think that's just right. He hasn't quite grasped the extent to which the action is perceived as theft and a projection of the United States' hegemonic control over the world's banking sector. The truth is, the White House is saying, we haven't split the money. We, we, we took a certain portion of it, and we want to spend it off to a humanitarian trust fund to be spent on the people of Afghanistan. We're simply keeping half of it in the U.S. so that plaintiffs for 9-11 uh, families can seek to get it through a judicial process, through the courts. But this is very disingenuous, because the truth is the parties would not be able to get at that money unless it was seized pursuant to an emergency order like it was on Friday. They literally would not have prevailed in court were it not for this order. They couldn't prevail in court without this order. So, in fact, what the order does is make it possible, really, legally possible, for those victims to get a shot at it. They may still fail because of other legal provisions and procedural complexities. Plaintiffs against Iran in the terrorism sector have also had a lot of difficulty, legal difficulties in attaching money that belongs to Iran. So they may still fail, but in seizing the money, uh, they've, they've actually, the U.S. has actually made mm. it easier. And it's unfortunate, especially because it doesn't belong to the Taliban. And it's very difficult to see how it could be utilized to satisfy a judgment against the party, which isn't even recognized mm. as the sovereign. If then this money belongs to the people of Afghanistan, is President Biden saying that if it was a government that we trusted, we would give the money back, but we just don't have faith and trust in the Taliban? Is that what they're actually saying? It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, it's, it's like that to a degree, because they've blocked the money already. They've blocked the money of the Myanmar military hunter in the Central Bank of Myanmar, too. But they didn't seize it. They didn't take it. They just blocked it. So it's mm -hmm. one thing to block it because you don't want the Taliban to get it. It's another thing to seize it and put it in a dedicated account. It no longer belongs to the Central Bank of Afghanistan anymore. It belongs to Joe Biden. He can give some of it to a trust fund that may ultimately provide um, assistance, maybe even through the central bank. But as of right now, the money has been seized mm. by the United States and they've taken. So there's another issue, of course, which is simply that the concern now isn't with the humanitarian assistance being available. There's a billion dollars in a World Bank trust fund already. And there's two billion in other foreign currency reserves in other countries like South Korea and in the EU and UK. So the issue isn't the money. The issue is the restrictions that have been placed on Afghanistan's central bank that make it impossible for it to bank on the international system. Those restrictions mean mm. there's no amount of money you can give them if they can't move it into the country and utilize it as actual dollar. But the Americans surely must know that these restrictions and the seizure um, in the end, it's the citizens of Afghanistan that stand to suffer, that they're not helping those citizens. Absolutely. You said earlier in the interview that uh, the Biden administration perhaps misread the room. Yes, exactly. They misread the extent to which people of Afghanistan across every political framework, from women's rights act activists to the Taliban itself, saying this money belongs to the, the people of Afghanistan. And right now, the biggest issue is the country's banking sector and economy is in collapse. And the central bank needs this money, not to necessarily to pay for humanitarian relief. The UN has already offered humanitarian relief. But to get the economy functioning again so that people have jobs and can pay for goods and pay salaries, this is what will ultimately make sure the country doesn't 
get gripped into mass famine, not just humanitarian assistance, mm. but economic activity that you know, brings the economy back from the cusp. But there is a clear hegemonic and almost racist uh, tendency that is hanging over this thing, where the United States seems to think that it's natural to be able to take money mm. from a country uh, that it can perceive as you know, not being able to take care of its own affairs. It's very shocking, you know, even in Europe and in the global south and in Asia, that a country would think that way, think that they could just take the sovereign wealth mm. of another country because it knows better how to spend it. Talking about possible miscalculations, I mean, on the one hand, they've got this uh, Taliban phobia for sure. Now, when you restrict, seize, and make it difficult for the people in the country to survive, does that not then help popularize anyone who's resistant to governments that are doing that to them? Absolutely. I mean, if you wanted to foment more anti-Americanism, this is a perfect way to do it. If you wanted to unify people, this is a perfect way to do it. If you want to destabilize the country more than it already is by fomenting famine and increasing economic and food insecurity, this is the way to do it. And that's why this decision makes so little sense. I think politically what they were trying to do was walk a fine line between appearing to help the Taliban, which this doesn't, um, and uh, helping 9-11 families, um, allowing 9-11 you know, families to get a shot at the money. But there's another way they could have done that. They could have walked into court quietly and said, this money doesn't belong to the Taliban, I'm sorry. Mm. And then the cases would have been resolved and this money could be spent on the people of Afghanistan. It didn't need to be taken away from the people of Afghanistan in order to help the people of Afghanistan. It, it literally didn't have to happen this way. And I'm afraid it was a decision that was made for political reasons, not out of um, interest in the national security of the U.S. or the interests of the people of Afghanistan. I was just about to ask that, that, you know, it, it, it sounds more like there's a compelling political agenda rather than um, anything else playing out here. But why yes, would that I be, though? The Biden, administration, the Biden administration does not want to be seen as blocking efforts of September 11th victims to obtain this money. They don't want to see, mm. see that happen. And perhaps if they're playing very wisely in Machiavellian, they know that the families will fail. And yet they say they're making it available for the families, knowing full well that their legal case will fail. And then they'll be able to turn around and spend this money in another way. But I doubt that they're that sophisticated. I think more likely they're just trying to be all things to all people. But it's coming off terribly, and it's caused immense anger across the world and reflects terribly on the administration's mm -hmm. priorities. But it, it also reflects this hegemonic thinking, um, this, this hegemonic thinking where the administration seems to think that it can just decide things on its own without mm -hmm. consulting its allies, without consulting Afghans, and without considering what this looks like from the perception of people in other countries and in the global south and across Asia. It, it simply doesn't reflect mm. uh, well on them. All right. I mean, it's one thing to sign an executive order in your country and make whatever you want legal, but there is international law, I guess. Is there no international law that yeah. might be a problem for the Americans in this regard? Oh, absolutely. The government of Iran has sued the United States and the International Court of Justice because of the judgments against the Central Bank of Iran, um, against them related to old terrorism claims that you know, have been going on for decades. These cases take decades to resolve, uh, but the idea that a central bank's you know, wealth could be used to satisfy the, you know, the judgment for the crimes of a country's leaders is highly problematic. And yes, there's good reasons for even an abusive, rights abusing, uh, even terrorism supporting regime to question the idea of taking away a country's assets. I mean, take going all the way back to the beginning of sanctions in the modern era, 
in the case of South Africa and the comprehensive um, sanctions laws that the U.S. passed in 1986, none of that ever seized any of South Africa's assets. It just said you can't do business there, you can't uh, make money with them, you can't give them money, you can't lo loan them money, but nobody ever said we're seizing South Africa's assets. That didn't happen. I mean, there was mm -hmm. still economic impact, don't get me wrong, and those should be weighed, but nobody ever seized the assets. Where you see countries seizing, where you see the United States seizing assets, um, it's typically when they've made a, a, a judgment about the people um, as somehow mm lesser than, uh, you know, the United States of America. You don't see it happening uh, with European countries that are under sanction. You don't see it with Asian countries. The Myanmar Central Bank, for instance, has not had its assets seized. So, you know, that's why mm. I'm concerned that there's an underlying, perhaps unconscious, hegemonic, and perhaps, you know, unconsciously racist mindset at work here um, in, in doing this, because I can't imagine it being so easy um, in other settings. But the thing is, I think there's still hope for the United States to repopulate the Afghan Central Bank with these funds. It's just now it's going to be much more difficult because it has to move to a third party, the World Bank, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, the money may end up getting back into the central bank's hands via an intermediary. You know, such things have happened in Yemen and Venezuela, but it's going to be tough, and, it's, and they've made it more complicated, yeah. and they've made it take longer. It's going to take longer. And also, I guess in the end, actually, they are blaming the wrong people because the Afghan people did not kill. Uh, the victims of 9-11. Uh, Osama bin Laden is not Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. It's behind all this, it's just the easy, easy assumption that somehow the Taliban carried out 9-11. They didn't. They hosted, the they hosted Al Qaeda at the time Al Qaeda was planning the September 11th attacks. They offered to hand over Al Qaeda after the September 11th attacks, which they argued they didn't know about. And there's never been any compelling evidence to demonstrate that they did know about the attacks before they were planned. Now, I'm not defending the Taliban. We've written countless reports about their brutality, their human rights abuses, their untrustworthiness. Uh, which has exhibited itself to men again and again and again. But the idea that they should satisfy a judgment that is primarily against al-Qaeda to the tune of $3.5 billion uh, doesn't make any legal sense. And I think if the legal, uh, if the courts decide this well, they'll recognize that and recognize that, yeah, that the Taliban may be bad and they may have hosted al-Qaeda but A, they didn't, they're not responsible for the abuses. And B, even if they were, they don't own this money anyway. The Afghan people did. So you can't take the people's money to pay the Taliban's debt. Mm. All right. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. Your insights greatly appreciated. Thank you.